thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you all for uh, getting up early to be here. There will still be people coming in. Um, they're all more than welcome, of course. Um, I will try to share with you um, how a company such as Philips is making the transition into the Internet of Things. Um, it's a story that maybe that applies to Philips, but it maybe applies to more corporations. Um, it's it's also up to you to respond to it. I, I would love if a few people raise their hands afterwards and give some comments. Maybe you work in a corporation yourself. Maybe you work in a small company and you tell us what is different. Um, I'll try to keep my talk short so we have a few minutes for uh, a few questions. You know, the three generations before, really, like 100 years, we've seen the emergence of a big global data field. It is the planet itself, it's its natural systems. It's all of us humans, it's all the physical objects. Do you realize that this always has generated a tremendous amount of data? We just could not see it. I think that is the number one thing that we should be aware of at this conference, that this big data has always been there. We just couldn't see it and we couldn't capture it, and now we can. Because all of these things around you have been instrumented with codes like QR codes, it was just on the screen, UPC, microchips, near field communication, and many other technologies, and they're all interconnected. So now we finally have access to this data. In effect, our planet has grown into a big nervous system and it is developing its own intelligence. So that's often visualized like this, right? You Google on the internet for images for your talk and you get all this kind of stuff. But the Internet of Things is about capturing data everywhere and connect everything with everything. It is exploding and it's not just Philips who tries to look into it and capture the value, it's everybody. But the, the real question for me is not how to connect, the real question is how to make this meaningful. How to build the wisdom on top of all this big data. We need to innovate that now. We need to understand what we build on top of that data and we need to capture the new opportunities that arise really now. Now we're all getting connected. But this requires a new way of working, a new way of working in the corporation at least. And I would like to explain that to you by, by sharing where I come from myself. You know what I see here? I see excitement and enthusiasm for something that that girl designed. She just delivered her first automotive design and she's not embarrassed to share it with you. She's connecting with you. She's just proud of what she just has created and she's proud to connect with you about it. I think this image encompasses much more than the, you know, than the rendering on the slide before. I think the way this creator, this designer, this innovator connects with you, asking for a reaction like how I just did when I started my talk, that is the way we innovate ourselves in order to capture the value of big data and the Internet of Things. My name is Roger and I'm a lighting designer. There are not that many in the world, but I found my passion like this girl, and after 30 years I'm still doing what I really love to do. I got inspired by this, and I'll show this to you so you understand where I come from. This is Appia, the Swiss sonographer, beginning of the 20th century. He sets Tristan and Isolde in a dark black and white space and gives the girl the light source that creates a space around her. He's creating the space just with light. And I do that in many ways, like here for Swarovski. Art works like this, working with artists like DJs, singers, rappers. This was done by my colleagues at Philips for Lady Gaga. 
but back to the Internet of Things, it's growing and it's growing so big. I'm sure these numbers, they fly around at this conference all three days. But you see, in the 60s there was nothing connected to the Internet. It took 10 years to connect 13 devices. It took 10 more years to connect 150, and then it went real fast. You see, you can read it in the back of the room. We expect 30 billion devices connected to the Internet of Things. And they're not just PCs or phones. They could be anything. They could be farms. They could be medical devices. They could be traffic lights. Anything. So how do you deal with all of that? How do you deal with the vast size of the Internet of Things? That is where innovation goes much beyond product innovation. You know, it's business innovation for us. We're a big corporation. We're around $30 billion. We have to understand this. So I need to take you back again into the history of innovation at Philips so you understand the transition that this company undergoes in order to have the answers in the Internet of Things and raise more questions also, perhaps. This is a lamp, and that is a bloody good lamp. It gives a lot of light at super high color rendition. It's actually used in stadiums, in sports stadiums, soccer, football. I say this lamp does not give light. This lamp has enabled television recording. But what it really has done for the world is it made the match available to 200 million viewers. That's the real value of innovation. Philips made a lamp with a better color rendition, suitable for TV recordings, and suddenly the world could watch the match. This is how you could think about the Internet of Things as well. But the way it comes along has changed. This is more or less how that lamp was developed. Well, that lamp was developed in the 80s, and this photograph was taken at Philips in the 50s. But not much had changed over those 30 years. Technology was developed in splendid isolation. And then it was manufactured in massive numbers, sending it to, we didn't know. We didn't know where we were shipping our products to. A lamp could work equally well in a hospital, a school, a home, or the streets. And then came the 70s, and we built this building, and we created the showcase of the progress of technology and humanity in a way. We showed the world the first interactive robot, the sensor. Today we innovate differently. You recognize this car? There is a logotype in the middle, but the two eyebrows made of light probably characterize the brand a lot more. This was originally an accessory sold for 2,700 euros on top of the price of the car. And now it's standard because it became such an icon of the brand. We created this with Audi to create value. Because the 32 LEDs on either side of the car, they look like this, and the cost of them is going down to one and a half dollar cent. 2700 versus 1.5 cent. You see the value of innovation and design. That is the big story. So we don't do that anymore like this, where people make products but have great ideas but cannot, you know, release those and add those to the innovation process. Or like here, this is a historic photograph of the Philips factory in Rosendal on the Belgian border. I think the next wave was that everybody got empowered to create what he had on his mind, and it was very much like do it yourself, the maker movement. I take a big leap. The maker movement is the people who create, build, design, tinker, modify, hack, invent, or simply make something. And now we are experiencing the next wave from do it yourself to do it together. You see these young guys? That's a whole bunch of talent together. There's probably a designer, a software engineer, a 
techie, a programmer. And they're, they got together, and it is the technology, the Internet of Things that, have, that has empowered them to get together and to make together what they want to make. I think that what this really does to all of us is it brings together these three worlds. Business, play, and education. And that's a very important recipe. The Internet of Things can bring together these three worlds. We are reinventing how the whole system works. Because in the time of the factory that I showed you, these three worlds, business, play, and education, they were very separated. And now, it's all getting connected and it enables us to connect these three worlds and to innovate faster. We can create places where these three worlds live happily together, where they meet and where they make something new. And the great thing is everybody, all of you can contribute. You don't need to go to the factory anymore. And you can make better and design better what was done before you. We call that digital fabrication. And this is a fantastic example in the south of Spain, where this square in Sevilla became abandoned and a crime scene. Real estate prices dropped. Small shop owners had to close their business. Until the German architect Müller created this piece. A big parasol made out of wood where every element is different to create this flowing organic shape. <coughs> But the cost of it was so competitive, as if everything was straight in the same dimensions, thanks to digital fabrication, thanks to the Internet of Things. Because Maya worked together with his whole team, even though they were all remote. And he could make a prototype with the help of a 3D printer that was connected to his computer somewhere else where he designed the parasol. The Internet of Things in the real world. It's a thin layer of technology that em enables and empowers so much more. It enables getting together, exchange, accelerate innovation, and make a more sustainable economy. And I think that is what city governments should invest in, so companies can build further on that. They asked me to make this talk about the transition of Philips, but I think it's a transition of many corporations. Because what you can see now emerging is a lot of vertically integrated making change. Our authoring tools, creative software, design studios, communities, 3D printing, distribution. You know that a couple of years ago, Autodesk acquired Instructables. This is very interesting. Autodesk has 10 million professional users designing our world. Instructables is where you put your instructions when you know how to make something. Any individual can contribute. And my prediction is that Autodesk is not going to tell Instructables what they should do in the future. I think that Instructables is going to tell Autodesk how they will be in the future. I have more examples. These are two students from the Technical University in Eindhoven who developed a robot that does eye surgery 10 times more accurate than the best eye surgeon in the world. These guys are 23 years old. And they're changing the way we make people healthy. There's Arduino, of course. An open source electronics prototyping platform. I think many of you know what I'm talking about. Very easy to use. Intended for artists, designers, perhaps hobbyists. But definitely anyone interested in connecting objects to environments. The Internet of Things. It's about $20 or something, too. And it connects anything. And then there is the way we educate. Making something helps students to understand science and math. Like on this picture. This is the in Institute for Advanced Architecture in Catalonia, in Spain. Connectivity gives the knowledge in the city a very competitive edge because making, which could not be possible without being connected, is affordable, exciting, and rewarding. 
a great way to stop the crisis in education. And this is what they make. And that is very much after my big idols. I'm a designer, I told you. Frank Lloyd Wright, Raymond Louis, Ovi Arab, Charles and Ray Eames, they all could make things. They loved thinking with their hands. And that is why they are still my big examples. Because thinking with your hands is what is really enabled by the Internet of Things. I give you an example from Philips. You know we have a colored lamp that you can change with your iPhone, but it gets really excited when you connect it to if this, then that. A very simple platform that allows everybody to script how their different devices act together. And you can share those ideas and scenarios. I did a search this morning on IFTTT. Philip Hugh, 1,200 recipes found. It's a whole global community contributing to how our stuff gets connected. Remember, we connect business, play, and education. But you will say, well, that's just a colored lamp. There are bigger things to solve. Yeah, that's right. But it's still great news because these are people, real people, like you and me, who invent and build. And you know the people who invent and build are the ones who change the world. The people who remix something and hack it in a better way. These new questions, they require new answers and a new way of solving. And I'm talking about the big things like this. You know, 30% of commuting time in the United States is wasted in urban traffic congestion. That's 90 billion hours of manpower, you know, that we just lose. Actually, 12% of all urban congestion is just only caused by parking, trying to find a parking spot. And 70% of all fuel in cities is wasted in front of a traffic light waiting. 70%. The average Parisian spends four years of his life trying to find a parking place. And this one was not so lucky. <laughs> you see what I mean? The Internet of Things can solve this. And there are other questions like privacy and security, right? This is Christopher von Hassel, and he hacked his father's Xbox account. Yeah? And he got, a, he got acknowledged for that on the Microsoft website five years old. You see, it's about the way we interact. The general pattern of the Internet of Things application is not a sensor, a network, and an actuator. That's maybe what you think. But it is the human plus the network, plus the actuator, or maybe the sensor, and then the network again. And that way, we broaden the possibilities for interfaces and business models. This is one example of a luminous ceiling that we can control based on activity underneath, color temperature and so forth. And this is a first application in a very famous computer retailer who opened a shop in Turkey where they applied this. And I like to quote Bill Campbell in the board of Apple who says, we live in a world of product creation. It's made by engineers. But we need those who can think it all the way through. Because then you start to connect cows to the internet. And they will tell the farmer that one of them is falling ill. And the doctor can come and be very targeted. And half of the diagnosis is already made. Or we grow vegetables in places where we could not do that before. In my city, Amsterdam, 30% of commercial real estate is empty. You can't believe that, but, you know, we put farms in there so we can feed the city with fresh veggies. Or we regulate the lighting in the city uh, based on user scenarios and who is in the street. And this is one of the operators in the city of Rotterdam. It's not a big city on an Asian scale, but still a million people who have a better life in public space thanks to the Internet of Things. So in Business Week in 99, it was written like this. In the next century, public uh, planet Earth will put on an electronic skin. It will use the internet as a scaffold to support and transmit its new sensations. What a brilliant forecast. 
We have to solve design problems that the Internet of Things brings. Because this is the colorful lamp, and this is its switch, and it's wireless. So you do not want to connect it to the wall where there's a wire, because then you don't need it. But how does it get its power? Replacing a battery in a switch, that would be very silly. This is our switch that includes uh, capturing the kinetic energy of touching the button. And that is enough to power it up for its entire lifetime. This is how colored light and television are getting together. And this is what happens when we give artists our colored lights. The shopping experience is getting better because your phone knows what you're looking for. And the doctor can concentrate more, thanks to the Internet of Things. This is our standard solution in the operation theater to tell the doctor, you know, your, your, your vital numbers. And we are changing this into Google Glass and realize the proof of concept that you can see here. This is seen through the doctor's uh, viewpoint. Smog, in this part of the world, a big issue. We could already clean it. But what happens when you connect the air purifier to the Internet of Things is that you can educate people about the air quality and what to do to keep it clean and how much clean air they had already this week, this month. It's becoming a whole story. And if I continue Bill Campbell's statement about the engineers that need to think all the way through, then he said, we need to create the metaphor. We need editors of all these products, curators who understand what motivates people. Combining this with engineering is the basis of anything great. At Philips, we make the Internet of Things the Internet of People. Thank you very much. I'm sure if anybody has any questions, we can take those quickly now. Um, if anybody does have questions, please let us know. Yes, gentlemen over here, maybe we have a microphone for you. Thank you. Um, just a, an observation. With all of the development, technology and so forth, why is it when you drive through a city at night that all the lights are on? Sorry, could you repeat the last bit? Why is it? Why is it that when you drive through a city at night and the offices are empty? The lights are on. The lights are on. So with all the technology that we have today, when are we going to see the lights off at night? Well, in this part of the world, I heard people work until very late. <laughs> so that may be why. In my office in Amsterdam, we switch off the lights, but I must admit, we just innovated the whole installation, 23 floors of the tower of Philips headquarters, and added mo uh, motion sensors and stuff like that. And now you see the lights going off, one by one, between five and six o'clock, I tell you, except floors two and three, which is where design is based. They're always on. But it's really a matter of innovating. I mean, there is this, I mean, there, there is, what, 70 billion worth of office lighting installed and, you know, 95% of it is still conventional. And it's very hard with the conventional lighting technologies to uh, connect it to uh, devices that could switch it or dim it. The big advantage of LED is that it's a chip, it's digital. It's already digital. It behaves like any other chip in your phone or in your TV or whatever. So it's very easy to control it and to connect it to the Internet of Things. So what companies should do in order to be more sustainable with regards to their office lighting is first make the switch to digital lighting and then it's very easy to connect. These are long discussions, you know, right? Because this involves accounting, depreciation of the current installation, 
I'm sure that the chief financial officer thinks different than the chief sustainability officer and all that sort of things. But we can do it, and of course our own building is a showcase of what it could be. So I hope it answers your question. Yeah. It's a good question. Uh, as time is pressing and as we were late starting, I do hope that if you have any other questions, you would feel free to take these offline with Roger. Of I'm sure he'd be only too delighted to answer your questions. Roger, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much.